Shabbat shalom, everyone. Shabbat shalom, Miriam, you're on. Yeah, um, I just share screen. Um, I've got to get onto my PowerPoint. How will I do that? That's better. Um, in this teaching on the tabernacle, we will look at the garments of the high priest and the priests. In Exodus 28, the Lord says to Moses, Now take Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister to me as priest. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadav, Abihu, Eleazar, and Itamar. And you shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother, for glory and for beauty. And so shall you speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they make, may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a skillfully woven tunic, a turban and a sash. So they shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons, that he may minister to me as a priest. And that's the um, uh, Aaron there being fitted with garments and the boys waiting for theirs. Then the Lord goes on to give the exact details of how Aaron would be clothed for his high priestly role and Aaron's sons in their role as priests, helping Aaron so that they could minister unto Yahweh in the place where the presence of his glory would dwell. This was to continue in the generations to come, all descendants from Aaron of the tribe of Levi. The Lord chose certain people and gifted them with talents and skills to be able to work artistically, to make these beautiful garments and to make everything exactly as the Lord required. This was the same for all the other things needed to make the tabernacle. Everything was skillfully and beautifully made. You see, when God wants you to do a work for him, he will equip you with the right skills and talents. Don't ever let your God-given talent go to waste. So Moses set up about organising the making of the special clothing that Aaron the high priest and his sons would wear. Aaron as high priest had the much, much fancier robes while his sons had the plain white linen robes. When everything was made according to the Lord's instructions given to Moses, the whole nation of Israel came together to witness the first priestly ceremony and offering unto the Lord. The priests would be set apart and consecrated to the Lord and the entire nation would be witnesses to this event. Exodus 29, 4. And this is what you shall do to them to hallow or make them holy for ministering to me as priests. Take one young bull and two rams without blemish and unleavened bread, unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers made of wheat flour and anointed with oil. That's things required there. You shall put them in one basket and bring them in the basket with the bull and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons and you shall bring to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and you shall wash them with water. So water is very important in all of this. This was first cleansing with water, then being clothed with the appropriate garments for service unto the Lord. Just like us, when we accept the Lord in our lives, first we come to him for cleansing of our sins. Then we are clothed with the righteous garments of salvation cleansed and made whole, ready in service unto the Lord. Aaron is then dressed in the holy garments of the high priest and the turban with the golden crown placed on his head. Moses then had to take the anointing oil and pour it on his head to anoint him. For the anointing oil, they had myrrh, cinnamon, sweet cane, cassia and olive oil. And this made a very beautiful aromatic scent. And that's Aaron there with his high priest's uh, garments on. Psalm 133, 1 and 2, and you're all familiar with this psalm. 
it speaks about this. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren and sisters too to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head that ran down upon the beard of Aaron that went down to the skirts of his garments. Thus Aaron was anointed for service as the high priest. Then Moses was told to bring Aaron's sons and clothe them. The priesthood would be theirs for a perpetual statute and they would be consecrated to the Lord. The bull was then brought and Aaron and his sons had to uh, put their hands on the head of the bull. Moses then had to kill the bull by the door of the tabernacle, take some of the blood and put it on the horns of the brazen altar with his finger and pour all the blood beside the base of the altar. Parts of the, altar, the bull were then burned on the altar and parts of it were taken outside the camp and burned as a sin offering on their behalf to make them spiritually clean. In a way, because of what Moses had to do to start the Levitical priesthood going, um, he acted also as priest even before Aaron did. So that's quite interesting, isn't it? Although he wasn't called to be a priest. And there's a picture of um, Moses putting his hand on the bull. Then one of the rams was offered on the altar as a sweet aroma to the Lord, and the other ram was offered for consecration. Aaron and his sons were to eat of the lamb and the bread from the basket. Exodus 29:33. They shall eat the food that made the atonement to ordain them and to make them holy. Moses had to take some of the ram's blood and put it on the tip of Aaron's right ear on his right thumb and on his right big toe. The same was to be done with Aaron's sons. Then some of the blood from the altar and some of the anointing oil was sprinkled on Aaron and his garments and also his sons, so they would be holy. And that's found in Exodus 29, 21. And this is where by anointing their right ear, it represented right hearing their right thumb represented right actions, works and service, and their right toe represented a right walk. Everything had to be right. So they were ordained into the priesthood. Aaron was ordained twice, whereas his sons were anointed once. This special anointing of Aaron set him apart as high priest. The anointing oil made Aaron and his sons holy unto the Lord, it seems that Aaron had the greater portion of the anointing oil on him, which set him apart unto the Lord even more than his sons. Moses also used the anointing oil to anoint everything in the tabernacle to make it holy from the altar and all the utensils to use to everything else in there. Now, the garments to be worn in service unto the Lord, there were four articles of clothing that all the priests, including Aaron, wore. There were white linen breeches. All the priests wore linen breeches, which were undergarments that fit from the waist to their knees to gird their loins and cover their nakedness so that when they went up the ramp to the brazen altar, the Lord wouldn't see their nakedness. He didn't want to see their flesh. Each priest was responsible for putting on his own breeches to cover his bare flesh. They had to bend their knees to put them on, and this is humility before service. White linen tunic or robe. This was a long seamless garment. Then there was a white linen sash tied around the waist, but Aaron's also was of blue, purple, scarlet and gold thread. White linen turban, long strips of white linen were wound around the head as a covering. And this is a picture here of the high priest's clothing and everything that he had, uh, which was a lot more than what the boys had, the, the normal priests, the Levites, Le Levitical priests. And here with the white linen turban that was worn on the pri high priest's head, a gold crown made of pure gold like a headband was worn on Aaron's forehead as well at the front of the turban. Now this was to be engraved with the words holiness unto the Lord and in Hebrew kadosh le Yahweh or kadosh le yud -Hey vav -Hey, with blue ribbons attaching it to the turban. This represented having a holy mind 
and right thinking. So holiness would always be on Aaron's mind when he wore it, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel shall hallow in all their holy gifts and it shall be always on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. And that was the um, crown part at, made out of gold with inscription, Holiness unto Yahweh, Kadosh le Yahweh. Now this is the white linen robe and breeches, and this was the same for all the other priests, plus Aaron had to wear this as well. And then there was, for Aaron, a blue linen tunic or robe. This blue robe, and uh, remember blue is heavenly character, was seamless. It was woven in one piece with an opening for the head so that uh, uh, this opening or neckline was to be reinforced so that it was hard to tear. It was worn over the white linen tunic but did not reach as far down. On the hem of this blue robe, there were pomegranates of blue, purple, scarlet, and bells of gold between them, all around them. This was so that when Aaron ministered before the Lord in the holy place, the sound of the bells tinkling would be heard in there and as he walked out. That way, everyone knew that all was well and Aaron's service on behalf of the people was acceptable to the Lord. Exodus 28, 35 actually tells us, the sound of the golden bell shall be heard when he goes into the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out that he doesn't die. And this is the robe of blue uh, with a reinforced neckline so that it does not tear. This robe was worn over the white linen gown and the ephod with the breastplate was worn over this. And there's the pomegranates and bells on the hem with the uh, blue, purple and red. And uh, there, there is meaning for those colours as, as well, which I did speak on another time. And then um, now think about this. Yeshua had a robe that was seamless. It was woven from top to bottom. And at his crucifixion, there were lots drawn to see who would get his robe. John 19, 23, then the soldiers, when they had crucified Yeshua, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat, tunic or undergarment. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top in one piece. This was no ordinary robe. Verse 24, they said therefore among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore the soldiers did these things. Now, um, was Yeshua going to the cross in this priestly robe as our high priest? I'll leave the question with you. Verse 24, the soldiers did not tear Yeshua's robe, Compare it with Exodus 28, 32, which forbids the tearing of the high priest's robe. Psalm 22:18 18 says, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. Here in Psalm 22, his vesture is mentioned separately from his garments. Also the way that some of this, psalms, some of this psalm is written it's not past tense, it's present and future tense. I believe that Yeshua wore this special robe under his other garments, and it was a high priestly garment that he wore on his way to the cross. He made the ultimate sacrifice as our high priest. Thank you, Yeshua. We can never thank you enough for, for what you have done for us. Toda Yeshua. The ephod, woven of fine white linen and blue, purple and scarlet with fine gold thread, artistically worked. This was a smaller garment like a tunic, worn over the blue robe and the breastplate rested on top of it. Two shoulder straps of intricately woven gold would connect the ephod to the shoulders of where there were two onyx stones set in gold, one on each shoulder with the names of the 12 sons of Israel. 
And that's the ephod. It's over the, as you can see, it's over the blue uh, garment, the blue robe, and over, that was over the white robes. Now the, um, uh, um, breastplate. This was called the breastplate of judgment. It was worn over the ephod. It was artistically woven according to the workmanship of the ephod. And it was made of fine woven linen with blue, purple and scarlet thread embroidered with gold doubled over into a square so that it was 23 centimetres or nine inches square. And also um, Aaron had the sash, but not the white one. It was a long linen sash made of white linen and with blue, purple and scarlet colours with gold thread also um, woven into it and tied at the waist. Now that's the breastplate, which is worn over the ephod, the coloured ephod, which is worn over the blue robe. Now, by doubling over the material, this is for the um, breastplate, it would have made a pocket to hold the stones of the Urim and Tumim. And I'll talk about them later on. 12 precious stones were set in gold on the front of the breastplate, one stone for each tribe. Gold rings were attached to the breastplate and chains of gold like braided cords connected the breastplate to the onyx stone on each shoulder. Cords of blue were at the bottom corners of the breastplate and attached it to the ephod to hold it in place. The breastplate had four rows with three jewels set in each row, representing the names of Jacob's sons. Each of the 12 tribes was and is a precious jewel in Yahweh's sight and was represented before him whenever the high priest came into the presence of Yahweh. Each stone was engraved according to their names. And that's the picture there of the breastplate. Now, some people seem to think that the order of the names was different and that Judah was listed first, but I believe, that, but that's only my opinion, I believe that they were in their birth order and that that would have been starting with Reuben, the oldest son, and ending with Benjamin, the youngest one, as the word says, according to their names. So that's how I interpret that. The breastplate was worn over the heart and lungs, covering the emotions and the spirit and breath, ruach. Exodus 28, 29. Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate over his heart when he goes into the holy place as a memorial before the Lord continually. And that's where Aaron had the breastplate and with the names of the sons of Israel engraved on precious stones. And uh, as he went into the holy place, not the holy of holies, but the holy place, it was a memorial before the Lord continuously. And the names of the children of Israel were carried by um, Aaron over his heart before the Lord. Now, the jewels on the breastplate are found in Exodus 39, 10 to 13. And it says they were sardius, topaz, carbuncle, emerald, sapphire, diamond, jacinth, agate, amethyst, beryl, onyx, and jasper. The names of these gemstones vary in different Bible translations, and there are stones that we can't recognize or identify today, but nevertheless, 12 precious stones were used on the breastplate. And speaking of stones, the Israelites erected 12 stones or rocks as a memorial as they crossed the Jordan River on the final stage of their journey to the promised land. Joshua 4.23, the Lord dried up the waters of the Jordan River just as he did with the water of the Red Sea so that they could cross over dry shod. Verse 24 says, that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that you might fear the Lord your God forever. So these stones were erected as a memorial and a witness to this event. Now, these are the stones that Yeshua said would cry out and acknowledge him if the Jews would not. Luke 19, 37 to 40. The multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed be the king that comes in the name of the Lord, 
peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke your disciples. And Yeshua answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. These stones of witness would attest to who Yeshua is. 1 Corinthians 10.4 says that Yeshua was the rock that followed them throughout the wilderness journey. In Revelation, we see that the city of the New Jerusalem has precious stones and the 12 gates are made of pearls with each gate bearing one of the names of the children of Israel. What the Lord has set out centuries ago, he has continued on into the New Jerusalem. Now, the two onyx stones sat one on each shoulder of the high priest. Moses was told to employ the work of an engraver in stone to make it like the engravings of a signet. The onyx stones were engraved with the names of the 12 sons of Israel, six on one stone and six on the other. This way, whenever the high priest ministered unto the Lord, he carried the names of the tribes on his shoulders before the Lord. That's lovely, isn't it? Apparently, Joseph's stone on the breastplate was onyx, and this stone was also used as the two shoulder stones, and maybe this represented his sons, Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, who were called by Jacob's name. Remember Jacob surnamed them after him, and he said, these boys are mine. So maybe those two onyx stones represent those, those boys there. That's only my opinion. Now, getting to the Urim and Tumim. Urim is said to mean lights because Ur is light and Urim is plural and, and Tumim is perfections. And this can describe Yeshua who is the light and is perfect. Now this, the Urim and Tumim were placed inside the breastplate. Remember I said there was, the breastplate was folded over so it had a pocket inside. The stones of the Urim and Tumim were inside the breastplate of judgment, inside the pocket, so that they would be over Aaron's heart, so that Aaron should bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart when he went in before the Lord. I see this like intercession. When you come before the Lord to intercede for someone or something that is on your heart, you bring them before the Lord and they're on your heart. We don't know how the Urim and Tumim worked, now, there are theories that Moses held the stones up to the light of the menorah and then the reflections gave an answer. I have also heard that there were two white stones and two black stones. When the high priest put his hand into the pocket of the breastplate, he would take out two stones. If it was two white stones, the answer to the question asked was yes. If it was two black stones, the answer was no. If it was one white and one black stone, that meant that the Lord was not answering on the subject. To me, to me, this theory is more black and white, meaning straightforward, which makes sense to me, as I think of Revelation 2.17, where Yeshua says, To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone. And on the stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. How I see this is that being given the white stone, like the Urim stone, Yeshua is saying yes to the person receiving it. And you'll also get a new name and heavenly food to sustain you. Now, um, Saul uh, didn't get an answer by Urim and Tumim, if you remember the story. The Philistines had gathered their armies together to fight against Israel. Saul gathered all, the, all of Israel together. And when Saul saw the enemies gathered together, he was very afraid. And when the children of Israel didn't listen to Yahweh, he went and went to war, their enemies would beat them. As long as they remained faithful to his instructions, no harm came to them and they would be victorious over their enemies. 1 Samuel 28, 6, King Saul sought advice from the Lord whether to go to battle against the Philistines. But the Lord did not answer him, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. 
He had gone to the high priest to consult with Urim and Tumim, the stones, but still no answer. God remained silent. So then Saul was very naughty. He went to the wrong source to find out the future. He got his servants to find a woman with a familiar spirit so that he could go and ask her. He went to see the witch of Endor, which was totally forbidden by the Lord for anyone to do that, not even the king. This would have brought a curse on him. And we know that after this, things didn't go well for him. He ended up losing his life with his sons. Don't do it. It's the same today. We are not to go looking to find out what our future is from demonic sources. We are not to look for the future in the stars as in astrology. We don't put our trust in the stars. We have to put our trust in the Lord who made the stars, the creator of the stars. Amen. He is in control of our future. White fine twined linen. Linen is a cool material and you don't sweat sweat as much when you are wearing it. Sweat represents man's labor and effort. God doesn't want to be reminded of your own effort, only what you can do through him who strengthens us. Fine twined linen means that much care was taken to spin it into fine thread. Barefooted, the priest's feet were bare. They were to wear no shoes in the tabernacle as they were standing on holy ground. Remember, Moses was told at the burning bush to take off his shoes because he was standing on holy ground, and this is the same here. Isaiah 52, 7. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, that's Yeshua, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Of course, feet can also represent our walk with the Lord. We must walk in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The high priest wore his garments in the daily ministering unto the Lord in the tabernacle. And once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the high priest took off the coloured clothing and he just wore the white linen tunic with a sash, breeches, the turban and crown when he went into the most holy place the Holy of Holies. This is when he came before Yahweh's presence and placed the blood of the sacrifice on the mercy seat to atone for the sins of the whole nation of Israel. White robes are the robes of righteousness. Before the priest could, high priest could come directly into the presence of the glory of Yahweh, he had to make sure that he himself was clean. He had to make an offering to atone for his own personal sins. He had to make offering for his own soul with a sin offering, bathe and put on the white robes, and only then could he approach the mercy seat to bring the incense offering before the Ark of the Covenant and then place the blood of atonement there on behalf of all the people. You see, to come into Yahweh's presence, even if you are a king of this earth or a high priest, you have to come in with your robes of salvation and righteousness not your earthly robes of position and power. They don't cut it. Kings and paupers have the same standing with God. We all need to have our garments of righteousness made white, washed in the blood of the Lamb of God, Yeshua. A cloud of beautiful smelling incense rose up before Yahweh. This cloud of incense created a type of barrier between the high priest and the holy presence of the Lord. Remember, this was the blood of bulls and goats that just covered sin, unlike Yeshua's once and for all offering, which took away sin completely. It is the same today. When we intercede for people, we should come before the throne of grace and obtain right standing for ourselves and then bring others before the throne in prayer. And that's the high priest there in his plain robes ministering before Yahweh in the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. Fine white linen. Fine white linen is associated with the bride, the saints and the priests. In Revelation 19, 7 to 8, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made us hell freddy. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, 
clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Verse 14, and the armies which were in heaven followed him, Yeshua, upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Apparently, when the clothes of the high priest and the other priests wore out, they would be recycled. Um, the linen was made into wicks for the oil lamps on the menorah. So uh, recycling isn't new. They were doing it then. Now I'll come to the armour of God. Many people equate the armour of God in Ephesians chapter 6 with the uniform of a Roman soldier. But I believe that the armour of God is like the high priest's garments. Sister Miriam, can you repeat that statement? <laughs> Many people equate the armour of God in Ephesians 6. Remember Ephesians 6 talks about putting on the armour of God and it goes through all the things? Yes. And a lot of people think it's the uniform of a Roman soldier, but oh. I believe it's the armour of, armor of God is like the high priest's garments, and I'll go through it. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> all right, this is a pic here of the high priest's garments and the Roman soldier. Then I'll go through a little bit of of it and explain what I think. Ephesians 6, 10 to 18, and verses 10 and 11. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armour of God, make sure you're wholly clothed, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and we sure are living in evil days, there is much evil around today. And having done all to stand, that's all God wants us to do. He's having done all to stand in his armour and in his might, not ours. Verse 14 and 15. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, which we which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful. Now have our eyes open. What did Yeshua say? He said, watch and pray to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. Like the high priest was fully clothed with what the Lord required so that he could function in his duties, so must we be fully clothed spiritually. Loins girded with truth. The priests wore breeches to cover their nakedness. The breast, breastplate of righteousness, the breastplate over the heart, having a pure heart. Feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. A Roman soldier wore sandals or boots. They brought fighting and war. The priest's feet were bare. They were standing on holy ground in right standing with the Lord, walking in the right paths, bringing the gospel of peace, not an attitude of war like a Roman soldier would. The shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. I'm not so sure that a Roman soldier would have believed in the existence of the God of Israel. They worshipped other gods. The helmet of salvation, the white linen turban, covers the mind and thoughts. A Roman soldier would most likely have war on his mind. But remember, the high priest had holiness to Yahweh, and that's what we should have in our mind, holiness to Yahweh. The sword of the spirit, the prayers that were coming out of the mouth of the priest. The word of God is our sword. A Roman soldier's sword would be used to kill his enemies. But the God's word doesn't kill the enemies. He says, pray for them. Praying always with prayer and supplication in the spirit, which is the word of God. So I think that the high priest garments sound more like the armor of God. And Ephesians 6, 17 says, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We know that 
God's word cuts both ways for good and bad. It cuts, it's, it's got power. And this is what we've got in his word, power in his word. After the tabernacle was completed and consecrated, then the glory of the Lord's presence took up residence over the mercy seat and everything became most holy unto the Lord. This was all part of Yahweh's plan of having a sanctuary made so that he could dwell amongst his people. The tabernacle was also in the center of all the encampment of the children of Israel. So the Lord was right in the middle of them, not somewhere far away physically from them. And this configuration was also in the shape of a cross. And David uh, has mentioned this once before as well. And it's there for you to work out to see. It's definitely the shape of a cross with the tabernacle in the middle. And of course, Yahweh dwelling right in the middle. Amen. Today, Yeshua is our high priest after the order of Melchizedek. In Psalm 110.4, David says, The Lord has sworn and will not repent or will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek not only means righteous king in Hebrew, but my righteous king. Melech is king. Melchi is my king. So the Lord's saying that Yeshua is my righteous king. He is this king, Melchizedek, the Lord's righteous king. Hebrews 6.20, Yeshua is made a high priest forever, not for only a small time, forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was both priest and king, and that is what Yeshua is. And I believe, uh, this is my opinion, that the Levitical priesthood was in service until Yeshua, as our high priest, took over when he went to the cross. Now it is the Melchizedek priesthood, and in the fourth temple that Ezekiel speaks about, uh, the sons of Zadok, which means tzaddik, righteous, will be ministering there. Um, in that era. Sorry. Um, so Yeshua is made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, if you remember, he was both priest and king, and that is what Yeshua is. No, none of the kings could be priests and none of the priests could be kings. They were, had to have separate roles. But Yeshua could have both roles because he is who he is. So Hebrews 7.3, Melchizedek, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, Ben Ha Elohim, abides a priest forever. Hebrews chapter 7 tells us that the priesthood has been changed. It is not now under the order of Aaron, like I said, the Levitical priesthood, but under the order of Melchizedek. It is Yeshua who is our high priest, who offered up his life once for all time and lives forever to make intercession for us. Aren't you glad that he does? He is our high priest forever. He is the mediator between God and man. Yeshua entered the heavenly holy of holies with his own blood. Once making an offering to make atonement for all, he obtained eternal redemption for us. And Hebrews 9, 11 to 12 tells us this. Hebrews 8, 1 to 3, we have a high priest who is seated on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle in heaven, which the Lord pitched and not man. Yeshua is the only high priest who can sit down in the presence of Yahweh. And here we are, we have uh, from Hebrews 10, 11 to 12, and every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices over and over. That's what they had to do, which can never take away sins. They only covered the sins. But this man, Yeshua, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And we thank Yeshua for everything that he has done for us. We give all glory Honour, glory and praise to our high priest who loved us and washed us from our sins by his precious holy blood and has clothed us with the garments of salvation. 
He has made us kings and priests to minister unto him. Thank you, Yeshua. We can never thank you enough. Mm. The word of Yahweh. Thank you very much. That's the end. That was brilliant. Thank you, Miriam. Just so many insightful things in there. I just got so much out of it. It was wonderful. I'm sure everybody else has as well. So thank you very, very much. Thank uh, you. We're now going to go on to any questions and uh, questions and answers or reflections. If anybody would like to raise a question to Miriam, that, you're welcome. Just unmute yourself one at a time, of course. Um, just um, reiterating on the, the stones that were carried on the shoulders. Um, the onyx stones. Yep. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. um, they've carried like all the um, all the children of, uh, oh, what's his name, Aaron. Sorry, would, say that again. Um, would they have carried like just the two? Or could they have carried more? No, no the, the breastplate, if you remember, the breastplate had 12 stones. Yeah. And each tribe, like starting with Reuben, um, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, all of them, they had a stone each. And uh, then, then there were two stones on the shoulder of the priest, one yeah. on either side, and those two stones were exactly the same as Joseph's stone made of onyx which takes a high polish, and um, six uh, tribes, the boys, six names were engraved on one stone on the, on the shoulder, six on the other. But the other one was the breastplate. The breastplate right. was the world, and then the onyx stones, one on each shoulder. So mm -hmm. I believe that, that uh, God was also allowing for um, Joseph's two sons, who were not uh, Jacob's real son, like they were Jacob's grandsons, they were included in the tribes as well, Manasseh and Ephraim, because Jacob said, these boys are going to be my boys and named by my name, Israel. So they... Oh, right. Okay. Yes, yes thank and you. When the, when the priest, high priest came before the Lord um, in the holy place, he carried all of these, uh, the representation of the stones and the names of each boy uh, mm -hmm. before the Lord. So he, he interceded for them. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, great. Um, I have a question. Uh, at what point did they move from this priesthood and this outfits to the current uh, Jewish rabbis model? Uh, what, what they do now? I mean, uh, the Jewish rabbis, do they wear these outfits now? They don't, right? They do a different thing. No. So at what point did they move over to this? No, um, they had, when um, God instituted the priesthood with Aaron, the Levitical priesthood, it went up until the time of Yeshua and they had Levitical priests. And I believe when Yeshua did his work on the cross, that's when the Levitical priesthood finished. But because a lot of the Jews did not believe in Yeshua and his work and who he was, they continued the Levitical priesthood until the destruction of the first, the second temple, sorry, in AD 70. Once that temple was destroyed, there was no Levitical priesthood left there. There was no altar. There was no ability to sacrifice. And then the rabbis, then they were scattered. A lot of them were scattered. The rabbis then had to make up different things to try to make atonement. But God says without blood sacrifice, there's no atonement for sins. So all these years up, up until now, there's no proper priesthood to do that. And as we know, as believers in Yeshua, Yeshua is our Melchizedek priest. He is doing everything for us. But um, I believe when this third temple is made, yeah. Bill is coming soon, that the Temple Institute has got priests picked out and also a high priest and they're going to re restart sacrifices and uh, that's another big subject on its own yeah. but because they don't have Yeshua uh, because uh, mm. these Jews, the Orthodox Jews don't believe in Yeshua and his atonement for our sins then they are still trying to hang on to the old system but it's, it's broken down, it's not working because there's no temple
Amen. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I think uh, what is um, happening right now is uh, we have a better priesthood in Christ, in Yeshua, our priest and our king. Forever. It, uh, it is not going to regress back, although the system and the third temple will happen. The relevance is that for the Jewish people, Baruch Haba Bashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and that's Matthew 23, 39. So it is not the system of temple that will be relevant, although it is a flag and a marker of the times, but that Christ is our high priest and kings. Hebrews mm -hmm. chapter 9, 10, and 11. Hallelujah. What a great question. We have time for one last question. Can I ask one? Sure, when please. Talking, uh, when we're talking about the temples, um, I understood there were three temples, but um, Miriam, you said there was a fourth temple according to Ezekiel. Yes. Where, when is that going to be? There is going to be a third temple which is going to be built soon. Mm. And that's the one that I believe that the Antichrist is later on going to put his... Okay. Uh, but uh, that is going to be destroyed because there is a scripture that says... Uh, there's going to be a huge earthquake and all the walls are going to be uh, c tumbling down and that will be part of it. Right. And in Ezekiel, uh, from chapters 42 to 48, Ezekiel goes into a lot of detail about the millennial temple. And if you look at the um, dimensions of that and all the things that are in there, mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, much, much bigger than this third temple. And it talks about um, Yeshua or the prince coming to, to be in there. And it talks about the uh, sons of Zadok, Sadik, uh, oh, the yes, sons yes. of the righteous who will minister to the Lord. And this is in the millennial uh, kingdom. It will be the fourth temple. This is my opinion. And I have mm -hmm. spoken on, on this once before at Gates of Zion. Okay. Um, so the third temple, after it's been desecrated, I believe uh, uh, there is a scripture where it says all the walls are going to fall down. Mm -hmm. and that I, I believe will be part of that and uh, yeah. yeah okay thank you for that that's good is, that is a big subject you know if you look at study Ezekiel all those chapters 42 to 48 there's a lot of stuff in there mm. okay good great thank you very much so Anne and Amir would you like to make any comments if you have any Joanne and Amir is also part of our team. Hello, Shabbat Shalom everyone Hi, Amir. Hello. Yes, Good to see you. Yes, I did a bit of uh, I agree with Miriam with everything she said about the temple. Um, everything in the Ezekiel there and also in the book of Revelation, which describe who is going to be the 12 leaders or the 12 people who are sitting in the chairs around God. And it's a big topic, very, very big topic, very deep. And takes a long time to understand it and need a lot of praying and a lot of uh, uh, fasting if you really want to know the truth and uh, to understand it. And that's all heavenly thing. The temple, earthly temple, as we know, is all over, it's all gone. Mm -hmm. We don't need any system on this earth. Uh, as we see the Abrahamic accord, Accords coming um, and people don't talk much about it. I was talking to a couple of people yesterday from Israel they didn't even want to hear about it, but doesn't matter. We have to try and expose the lie. And, um, um, but yeah, the temple is a big story. We, it's a lot of it in the Old Testament and a lot of it in the New Testament also. And it describes who is this, but also the 12 people, or the 12 leaders is going to be there. That's a lot of Christians still asking who are they and have no clue who they are. But that's another topic we can talk later about, it, yeah. Thank you very much. Back to you, Alison. Okay. Well, well, now it's back to both you and Amir to close, uh, do the closing benediction. So okay. thank you very much. All righty. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, have you enjoyed today, everyone? Yes, thank you. Yes, yes. we enjoyed. Thank you. Yes. Very good. Uh, good. Very, very good. Very good. Very good. Can we have the slides? Absolutely. Those who would like the slide, please email us. Mr. Charity is our uh, government of staff uh, in charge of slides. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, thank you very much. And uh, those of you who are local in Perth, Western Australia, 
would you like to, if you'd like to sow into our offering and the administration and expenses of our ministry, we have a Commonwealth Bank account that is ready to go. And that is an um, uh, account where you can actually have the BSB and account number on the screen right now. And if there's anyone locally or internationally who'd like to sow into this, we always give up as we receive. Yeah, so we do not just keep we are like a Sea of Galilee. So, you know, um, we give out to persecuted Christians, Israel, our speakers. The last time we gave out to Sister Katarina Van der Beek, who talked about the Abrahamic Accord. We even sold into Pregnancy Problem House in Western Australia. So oh. we are pro-life, pro-Israel, and uh, pro-salvation, pro-Yeshua, everything that is pro. Hallelujah. Uh, just a very quick one. Uh, one word that summarizes Tough Ministries Incorporated. We are a one new man ministry. Amen. Amen. Neither Amen. Jew nor Greek, and uh, we're both Jews and Gentiles. Oh, yeah, we stand so one. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And thank you very much, those of you who have made history by coming to our Sukkot. I still love this beautiful photograph, and it's been yes, making right. eight ways around the world with our little video, everyone doing the little palm tree. That is actually biblical, by the way. In Revelation, everybody will be still waving palm branches. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise mm. the Lord. Our next meeting is on the 14th of November, 2020. So don't look at my face. What date is it? 14th of November, November. exactly two weeks from today. Woo! And it's going to be a face-to-face -face meeting with my uh, brother from another uh, mother. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> my good-looking brother, Reggie, from United Kingdom, Malaysia. Um, mm. It's going to be a face-to-face -face meeting. For those of you who are in Western Australia, all the way up to Albany, Manjima, Sister Janet, if you'd like to come, you can take a bus and a train. We'll be meeting at 2 o'clock, number 2, McNabb Loop, live streams, Christian Church. Bring your friends, bring everyone. We're going to talk about end times, vision of the silo, a vision of the last days. Uh, Reggie, Pastor Reggie is one of those rare speakers okay. that is Thanks. not actually pre-trip, not pre-trip, very brave. And... Um, Quite a few of us have listened to him in the last couple of years. He's definitely has got a very powerful message of the end times and a practical application, what you and I can do together. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And for those of you who have not listened, uh, there's a beautiful story of a Jewish lady's salvation on our YouTube channel, the Teshua Testimony of Sister Janet Carson. Janet, are you there? Hallelujah. Sister Janet, beautiful. Hallelujah. You must watch that. And not only watch that, share that with your friends. Share that with your friends. Anybody with a surname, Pereira, Rodriguez, Fernandes, they might have some Jewish blood. Share it with them. Share it with everyone that you know, Jews and Christians, uh, Gentiles, so that we can bring glory to God and get more people excited. 91 mm. years young. <laughs> accepted wow. the Lord. How amazing. 91 mm. Years young. Well done, Sister Janet, for sharing the gospel of salvation with her. The kicker and the deal cruncher was Isaiah 53. There was no need for introduction, but there was a need for a bucket for the tears from the mom when she yeah. heard the word of Isaiah chapter 53. The word of God is active. Thanks, Brother Amin, for your Bible, by the way. And um, for those of you who also um, would like a little encouragement, there is the latest testimony from Sister Kay's mom, late mother. It's such a beautiful testimony. We need to capture it. And so um, watch that as well, Sister uh, Kay's mom's uh, salvation story. And if you have a unique salvation story that you feel like you need the whole world to know and you need to get it off your chest to the glory of God, please let Sister Charity or any one of our core team know, our Allison, so that we can actually uh, come to your house in Perth or even do a Zoom with you so that we can share this with the world. And you know what? Mm. Testimonies are powerful. It mm. is the best way for you to reach out to your friends, your long lost relative, especially after COVID-19. People's hearts are tender. Sister Alice Chang is with us today and she's one of the champions of Australia for Jesus in Fremantle. We were just in Fremantle last Saturday uh, before, uh, because we don't have time. And we went up with Sister Alice. Alice was the, always the bold and brave one, like the commander in the Light Horse Brigade and the 1917 Battle of Bathsheba. She approached these two young girls who were barely 16, 17, 18 years old in high school. We shared the gospel from the beginning to the end. 
and they say the salvation prayer. Such Amen. things are unthinkable in Fremantle before COVID-19. But today, people's hearts are tender towards the message of salvation and the gospel of redemption in Yeshua. Amen. Amen. I know whether you are 16 or 19 or 91, the message and the word of God cuts through and bring about salvation to your household. It is amazing, amazing, amazing. So remember from 16th of May this year to the end of December, you can access all our every other week Shabbat at Taf. Um, even though when we do face-to-face -face meetings in uh, Como in Perth, we're still doing a Zoom so that the whole world can benefit. All our meeting ID and password is the same, 828-357-8288. Password is Shabbat 316. And um, we have a very special Shabbat welcome. Some ladies would like to do a little bit of parasha. And Sister Joanne Yoshida from Japan will be leading us next Friday, 6th of November at 8 p.m. KL Singapore, Brunei, Perth time, 9 p.m. Tokyo time. And where is Sister Joanne? Sister Joanne, if you are here, we'd just like to say hello to you so that we can actually connect with you and the rest of us. Thank you, Sister Joanne, for your leadership there in Shabbat welcome. Sister Joanne makes it very interesting, exciting, and she's full of insights. And um, uh, I still remember the first time, Sister Joanne, when we did it, all the ladies um, wear the little scarves and all that. And it was such a simcha moment. Amen? Joy. Simcha. Joy. You know, so next Friday, those of you who like to, men, women, you're welcome to participate and uh, uh, dial in, zoom in at 8 p.m. Uh, Perth time, 9 p.m. Tokyo time. And if you're in America, 8 a.m. Okay, very good. One last announcement, and then we are done. And then Brother Amir and myself will lead in the Berkat Kohanim. Uh, we have a biblical Hebrew lessons, eight-week lessons. Those from Singapore, Malaysia, if you have always been curious, um, you're welcome to sign up. Our vision is to raise 300 global biblical Hebrew scholars. Uh, Zoom batch three is in progress. Uh, the students are going to present in the next in three or four weeks' time. And please come for the presentation. Um, you probably watched this before. But next week, sometime between Monday to Friday, we're going to do a free halal bread making and aleph bed demo. And if you have more uh, interest, we may even do a free matzah bread making and aleph bed demo as well. Okay? Now, this is a very embarrassing picture because it shows me in the hospital with my cheeky daughter and my serious-looking wife on her smartphone. You may be wondering, why is this ungodly picture being shown on Shabbat? Well, it was a moment in time when I broke my leg. And after surgery, I was still deep in my anesthesia mode. So I was mumbling whether in tongues, I do not know, but I was speaking to a million things on my mind. And while my wife was busy on her smartphone, you can notice, you notice that actually my hand was grabbing her hand. The story that I'm trying to share with you is Davak. And this week, we have been having very serious conversations about Davak, Strong Hebrew 1692. Uh, I would like to encourage all my ex-students only, those who have come to any one of our batch one to six face-to-face -face in Perth or Zoom one, two, and three. If you'd like to, tomorrow, I'll be doing a special 15-minute deep sharing. This requires you to have prior biblical Hebrew knowledge. If you don't have, you will get lost. I mean, I don't. I welcome you, but you you still probably get lost. Okay, it goes all the way back to Genesis two twenty four, the principle of first use of a word davak, and uh, all the way to Deuteronomy and in the New Testament as well. So those of you who are my ex students, you're welcome for the first fifteen minutes. I will do a deep dive into the word davak for the benefit of everyone. It's part of my continuous improvement in my teaching that I will always remain sharp by researching and continuously researching and digging and praying so that God downloads. And as we download, we release this word and teaching to the world for free. Okay. Uh, good news is we have got a Zoom class for, uh, thanks to Pastor Linda in Sydney. Uh, it will start on 17 November. It's a very early time for Perthians. It's 4.15 p.m. Singapore, Malaysia, Perth, uh, but 7.15 Sydney, Melbourne, and Queensland time. You're welcome to enroll. There are still spaces available. Um, I just want to make this announcement today before we pray. This is a very, very important um, time today uh, because tonight, uh, as uh, one of our intercessors have highlighted to us, all over the world is actually uh, um, uh, 31st October. There is a The Other Side of the World event. But today is a very important milestone in 1917. How many of you can remember what happened today? Can anyone share with us what happened today? 
for those of you who are not from Perth. Anyone? Today, on this day, 31st October 1917, the light horse charge from Australia proved decisive for the Zionist dream of a future state. This is a very, very important charge. Two days later, after word of the victory reached London, Britain's foreign minister, Lord Arthur Balfour, issued a declaration calling for the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people. And uh, Prime Minister Turnbull said this many years ago uh, when we had the ceremony uh, uh, somewhere in, uh, in Europe. They spurred their horses through that fire, those mad Australians, through that fire and took down the town of Bathsheba, secured the victory that did not create the state of Israel, but enabled its creation, Mr. Turnbull said. Had the Ottoman rule in Palestine and Syria not been overthrown by the Australians and the New Zealanders, the Balfour Declaration would have been afterward. Today, this day, we remember the charge of the brave Australian Light Horse Cavalry who made this possible. And it was a precursor to the establishment of the state of Israel, ultimately, in 1948. Amen? Amen. 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 God is doing a new thing in Perth. Let your light shine before men. So tonight, when somebody come to your house and say trick or treat, share with them the story of the brave and bold Australians. Share with them the God who has given us mandate as priests and kings with the gospel of peace on your feet. Amen. Let us not be ashamed. Hallelujah. So right now, um, if you have any questions and comments, please email us at toughministry at gmail.com. Uh, we'll do the closing benediction right now. Uh, the Berkat Kohanim, I will do the English. And Amir, would you kindly please uh, grace us with the um, um, Hebrew rendition in Hebrew. Hallelujah. So Amen. now as we um, close this meeting today, we want to thank you, uh, Alison. Uh, thank Amen. you, all the Shofar Warriors. And thank you all, um, Yen, and, uh, for your wonderful worship and on the harp. Thank you, Johanna and the husband, Tal, who dialed in this, to share with us some updates on Israel and a wonderful testimony. And thank you to Sister Miriam for the wonderful teaching on the garments of the high priest. We always learn something new. And as someone said, the Old Testament comes alive when Sister Miriam speaks. Aren't we blessed? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. yes. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord mm -hmm. make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. I will uh, hand over the time to Sister Charity. If you have any questions, uh, please email Amir, Joanne, Miriam, or myself uh, through Sister Charity. And thank you and well done once again, Alison and team, for um, uh, chairing this whole session. It's been an amazing day. Shabbat Shalom and stay yeah. safe. And uh, may you and I be the light for Yeshua tonight. Amen. Thank you, David. Bye. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.